Welcome to the Economic and Political History Podcast, where we discuss the latest ideas on the intersection of economics, political science, and history. Everyone, welcome to a new episode of the podcast. I'm your host, Javier Mejia from Stanford University. Today, I have the great pleasure of being with Ya Shen Wan. He's professor of international management at the MIT Sloan School of Management, where he founded and uh, leads the China Lab and the India Lab. He's the author of a book that was published recently. It's called The Rise and Fall of the East, How Exams, Autocracy, Stability, and Technology Brought China Success and Why They Might Lead to Its Decline. Let me say hi to Yasheng. How are you? Hello. Hello, Javier. Um, I'm very happy that you're here. I'm very really glad that you're literally here at Stanford. And I, uh, we usually, and we were talking about this before, I usually record this remotely. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of the first times that uh, we're doing this in person, but it's certainly a much nicer experience. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. I appreciate that uh, that you're here. Um, I want to ask you first uh, about your, your career. Yeah. So I know that. You grew up in, in China, you yeah. moved to the U.S. to do your bachelor's degree, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, how was that process of adapting to a new country, but also a new society, a different and educational system? Yeah, so uh, thank you, Javier, and um, I'm very happy to be at uh, Stanford. I just gave a lecture, uh, and then I'm going to give another lecture um, today. Um, in terms of um, the career, um, I was one of the first uh, students from China who came to the United States in the early 1980s. And China then uh, was almost a world of difference uh, compared with the United States. It is, it is not just that the two countries were objectively different. It is that um, we had no knowledge about the United States before I came to this country. And the U.S. didn't really have m much knowledge about, about China. Unlike today, um, that, that, that at least, you know, the media, the, the public have some understanding of each other, you know, going back to the early 1980s, there was very little knowledge of each other it was not a smooth transition to be fair to, to be honest um, um didn't speak much english but a little bit but not really adequate um culturally uh, it was extremely difficult and, and a shock <laughs> um to navigate the u.s system and one thing you know uh to reflect upon is i came from a country that had um you know a lot of controls by the government um you know china in the early 1980s emerged from the cultural revolution cultural revolution ended in 1976 it was liberalizing but from a very low base and you came to a country that suddenly no longer had any those types of controls um it, it, it was very difficult to to adjust uh you know i remember um just just sort of how to interact with people and in china usually we didn't interact with people on the street and strike up a conversation with people you don't know. But U.S. is much more laissez-faire about, about these things. And people will come up to you and strike a conversation with you. That that was very, very difficult uh, for for me. Um, socially, it was kind of awkward. Um, and uh, also, I, I was so ignorant about the U.S. Um, that... Um, I saw people of Chinese origin working on campus, and that surprised me because I thought that there were only three students from China. How come there were like 10 other people working on the 
on campus. So this whole idea that they are Chinese Americans and the idea that a society can be so heterogeneous, those who are very alien uh, to us. Um, and you can take whatever courses you wanted to take. Uh, and the professor-student relationship is very, very different. Yeah, so all these massive amount of adjustments that we had to do. Uh, I'm, I'm curious about um, the changes that have occurred uh, ever since um, yeah. and how we think about China in academia, right? So yeah. um, I guess that uh, there was a massive influx after you arrived. Yeah. I guess it took some time of, of changing scholars and I'm for sure that dropped additional attention. So I want to hear uh, how was your experience of that as uh, an early caller? What was your opinion of this suddenly many other uh, students as, as you yeah. were? And then I want to ask you if you think that in the future that trend is going to continue. I've heard and that, that some people are concerned that with the increasing disputes between China and the U.S., this uh, regular flow of scholars is going to be interrupted. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so in the 1980s, when I first came to the U.S., the students from China who studied social science, topics, economics, political science, sociology, most of us were motivated by the question, how come China was so much behind the West and the rest of East Asia, Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan. So most of us wanted to answer that question, right? And some of us wanted to go back to China, go back to the system and reform the system from within. And, you know, others believe that the system was not was not fixable, right? So, but there were others who argued that you could reform the system from within. And that was a very hopeful era too. Uh, and that was reflected in my book. In the 1980s, there was far more freedom to discuss, freedom to of opinion in China. And the political reforms were on the table, even though they were not uh, proceeding very fast as compared with economic reforms. Economic reforms were progressing very nicely. Uh, so, so that was the kind of ethos at the time. The thing that changed was 1989 Tiananmen. And it just so happened I was in China in 88, 89, and I witnessed the part of the event, not the whole thing, but part of the event. And that changed many people's view about people like us, about how feasible it was to change China from within. And then many of us were thinking about, oh, maybe we should just devote our career to academia, to academic research, rather than thinking about going to China and change the country. So, you know, I was one of the one of the cohort, and then there were others who decided to um, to pursue academic research and, you know, and then sort of assistant professor, this is just a normal 10 year kind of trajectory. But that really, that recognition that, okay, let's just focus on research rather than thinking about the country, what we can do for the country. That was Tiananmen and, and that was the turning point. Um, and and then, you know, after the Tiananmen, politically, China was basically deadlocked. Uh, the regime path it was on, uh, it was no longer on that path. But economically, the country developed right, leaps and bonds, right? Uh, privatization, globalization. 
So that created a whole cottage industry of studying reforms, the conditions of the reforms, the consequences of the reforms. Also, it coincided with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the reforms in Eastern European countries, how they did it, and what the, the outcomes were uh, in those countries as compared with China. And then there was a revision of many, on the part of many of us, in terms of how we interpreted China, China's reform path, right? And the gradualism, which is associated with Chinese reforms, was viewed as a probably not a bad choice compared with what happened to Russia, compared to what happened in other transitional economies. Um, so that became the mainstream among those of us who study uh, Chinese uh, politics, Chinese economy, kind of gradual reforms, and, and maybe economic development, economic reforms as a way to change politics rather than the other way around, right? So the previous view was you need to change the politics in order to unlock economic development, but now it's the other way around, it's really about the economy first. And politics is kind of a, you know, using kind of a social science language is endogenous of economics. It is not exogenous and determinative of, uh, uh, of um, uh, economics. And that was also kind of official U.S. policy tool, right? Engagement theory, uh, uh, and all of that. That kind of was the consensus all the way through the time uh, of Xi Jinping. And now we have another revision, which is that uh, engagement didn't work. It didn't uh, unleash democratic forces. And uh, politics is, once again, a determinative factor, right? Rather than the indulgence of economics, is actually uh, controlling economics. Right? So if you look at sort of the, within the China scholarship, there's this kind of a transitional uh, milestones of how people adjusted and revised their views depending on what happened in China. Right? Um, and let me ask you then, and this to connect to uh, what, you, what you present in the book about the emergence of those two big concepts that you have to think about China, which are, you call that scope and scale, yeah. right? So please tell us what you refer to with, with those terms. Yeah. And when in that history of the evolution of your thought yeah. emerged those ideas and when did you think like, okay, that's are the basic concepts to think about China. So, so let me combine that question with our previous uh, discussion. Um, so a lot of the focus on the part of the students slash scholars like, like myself was on reforms, reform sequences, quite specific topics and topics that are relevant to that particular point in time, right? 1980s, 1990s. Increasingly, I grew dissatisfied with that research agenda. Increasingly, I felt that um, these period-specific topics are not sufficient to enable us to understand the larger forces that are happening in that country. So there's a, you know, building stability in the way that the politics unfolded in China, right? Uh, I call it reversion to the autocratic means, right? So, and and what is it that is always pulling that country to that center of gravity? It defies uh, economics. It defies globalization. It defies uh, intellectual exchanges that China has um, created since 1978, right? So it must be something extremely powerful, right? So that motivated me to think about a bigger topic 
um, that supersedes these immediate policy economic reform issues. So that's one. And the other is that uh, in thinking about that country in long stretch of time, not just you know 10 years and 30 years, it's very clear that the country has experienced both booms and busts, right? And the previous approach kind of focuses on one or the other, right? So the kind of China scholarship sometimes, sometimes it is divided between those who sort of celebrate the success of GDP growth, right? And second largest GDP in the world. Yeah, the economic miracle. The, the miracle, economic miracle, right? Um, and then those who um, point out great leap forward, cultural evolution. I think that both sides of the issues are there, right? So both of, both of them are factually correct and, and, and they are objective facts. Is there a way to tie these two things together, right, in a more integrated, uh, integrated framework? You know, if you can come up with a framework that can account for both the successes and the failures, right, so the two sides of the balance sheet, that's something I wanted to do, right? Rather than just focusing on, on one side of the issue, uh, rather than just devise a framework that explains one side. If you look at sort of the scholarship on reforms, until recently, it's all about success. It, it, it's it's almost like, you know, I, I include myself there, um, it's almost like China only started to exist since 1978, right? I mean, clearly that's not true, right? <laughs> China has been there for many, many years and for thousands of years. Um, so that was the motivation for me to write this book. And I didn't really have a framework. It was more of a, uh, at, at the very beginning, I didn't settle upon this scope, uh, scale and scope framework at the very beginning. It was really kind of a search, try different ideas, and, 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 and then hit upon this idea uh, in the middle of my project. I knew what I wanted to explain. And I kind of have a intuition that there was something deep in history that determined all these subsequent developments. But what exactly that historical force was required research, required thinking. And separately, I began to do some work on the exam system, the civil service exam system. And it hit upon me that that may be the the underlying kind of historically continuous influence that has shaped Chinese history and politics and economy for such a long period of time. But then the issue is, do you have data? Do you have, you know, facts to verify or to refute that? So, and then we spent six years constructing a database on Chinese technology uh, without knowing what the data was going to look like. Not at all, right? And then I began to look at the um, the communist system, right? How they rotate officials, how they promote officials, and then think about ways that that system can be linked with the civil service exam system that was established in the sixth century. There are a lot of scholars who study this issue. I'm, I'm definitely not the first one. Um, but they typically focus on mobility rather than this larger influence that the system can hold on the nature of their, uh, and the integration of the system, right? They, they look at upward mobility, people from commoner backgrounds can climb through the bureaucratic ladder, right? Um, so much of the scholarship is on that. Um, and then I began to think for a system that was so durable, 
for a system that was so systematic and well designed and watertight by historical standard, it must have an effect beyond the mobility, right? Recruiting the bureaucrats. And so, so the, the, all these things, I gradually arrive at, at, at the framework that I use in my book. And, uh, and you know, people, I leave the judgment to the readers whether different pieces of information fit with each other and whether or not they, they are coherent uh, narrative. But at least in my mind, they are coherent, right? And 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 the, and the historical data, as primitive as they are, fit with a larger timeline in terms of when the technology peaked, when the technology declined, and when this exam system was established, and when the exam system matured. How about if we talk about that? Because it is indeed the main basic institution and piece of your argument in the book, the exam system that I, I'm not sure if I'm, I mean, I'm pretty sure that I'm not pronouncing this correctly, the Kershu? Could you, yeah. Um, please give us some context of when it was established, yeah. from the sixth century, under which conditions, what were the incentives for it to be created? Why wasn't it uh, replicated in other places yeah. if it was, to some perspective or from certain perspective, successful? Please tell uh, me yeah. about that. So I'm pretty sure that the Chinese civilization invented the Kuzu system, the civil service exam system, uh, and then it was replicated in Japan, in South Korea, and in Vietnam. Uh, fairly quickly, and then with a more significant time lag, it was emulated in Prussia, and then Britain, and then the United States. Uh, so it was a remarkable Chinese invention that was emulated worldwide in different contexts, um, and, and that's a critical factor that I emphasize in my book in, in different sequences. So it was established uh, late 6th century, around 587. Uh, you know, historians sometimes debate about the date, but roughly late 6th century, early 7th century. And it was a, um, it was a system that um, that was, um, we, we don't really know the incentives because we they don't write about why they established the system, but we know the effect. The effect of the system was over time, a marginalized aristocracy, uh, hereditary nobility, and it promoted people from common backgrounds recruited them into bureaucracy. So the meritocracy was created because of the exam system. And in the sixth century, when it was first established, there was kind of a parallel system, like recommendation. But over time, the exam superseded the recommendation. These two competing systems have very different dynamics. Recommendation by definition limits the pool of the candidates. You have to know the people in order to recommend them. Whereas the um, the exam system is open ended; it's an application based system, right? You just apply um, rather than being recommended. So essentially, widen the pool substantially when the exam shifted from recommendation to the application. And social, uh, in terms of socioeconomic backgrounds of the people, they also created this change because anybody can apply, but only people with connections, with, um, with knowledge can get recommendation. Now, the Asian system evolved slowly. So I'm not saying that by you know, 588, it became, you know, fully established and all that. It took about 
uh, 300 years uh, for the system to evolve into its permanent um, state. Uh, and, and then later dynasties added features to the exam that made it uh, a, a, the scale, the, 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 the size of the exam made it uh, regular, right? So every three years rather than haphazard. Um, and also made it uh, watertight. Uh, they devised guardrails to guard against the plagiarism, cheating. Uh, they also did something very consequential, which which is that they established a nationwide system to prepare the people for the exam. Right. So if you if you only have the exam without preparing the potential candidates, then automatically the system favored the aliens, right? The aliens came with knowledge and came with, you know, with intellectual assets, yeah. right? Uh, so, so, they, so they really thought food, right? And that was a remarkable, remarkable idea um, in the ancient times to create an equal playing field between the rich people and the poor people. And we had a paper that looks at whether or not that system actually worked in the way it was designed, whether the anonym, uh, what we call anonymization protocol really worked, um, not in favor of the elites, but, uh, but, but, but as a playing, uh, equal playing ground. Yeah, statistically speaking, the backgrounds didn't matter. It's really remarkable. I mean, if you think about Stanford today, well, there's a famous case of a certain athletic uh, coach. And, and you know, it's think about Harvard, Stanford, um, less so in the case of MIT. I mean, yeah, I MIT. yeah, so that, actually less, MIT is, is, we don't have legacy admissions. And, um, you know, it, it, to, to, to actually treat people from, sort of humble backgrounds equally uh, as people from powerful families. That was a remarkable achievement. Uh, so China did that. Um, the preparatory school system, by the way, was free of charge. It was nationwide in, uh, in terms of scale. Um, so uh, by the way, let me just add that the whole system was only open to the male population and never liberalized to include the female population. So that system had a number of effects. One is that obviously the bureaucracy had some really smart people, right? At least if we define smart by their ability to memorize. Let me ask you about that. What were they being asked in the exam? And and please, if you can tell me a bit about the role of uh, Confucian thought here, yeah. because it's important in your... It's pure memorization. So let's just... just it's, it's, it's memorizing Confucian and classical texts. And you can write interpretive essays, but those essays have to adhere to the fundamentals of Confucianist philosophy and ideology. They also uh, began to ensure even if the essay followed the broad Confucian philosophy, they wanted to make sure that the deviation from any part of the Confucianism was so small, so they, uh, they devised a new philosophy. It's called a new Confucianism. It's a much more narrow version of the classical Confucianism, and then you have to adhere to the new Confucianism, right? The very narrow, very pro-autocracy, very pro-authority, right? And you couldn't deviate from that. And then they also wrote another, um, I guess, insurance policy into the system, which is that they specify the format. So you have to write your essay according to a uh, specific 
a specific format. You can't just write essay in whatever ways you want, even though you express the idea according to the new Confucianism, you have to adhere to the form. So all these restrictions, right, that memorization, raw memory, adherence to the new Confucianist philosophy, and the format with which you express these ideas, not your own ideas, but new Confucianist ideas, all of these mechanisms ensure homogenization of the human capital. And it was extremely successful, right? And I want to also point out that even though the number of people who succeeded at the end is not large, you know, mm -hmm. 300, 400, at the highest end, there were, there were also intermediate levels of the exam where more people succeeded. But that's actually not the final end of the system. The right way to think about it is how many people prepared for it rather than how many people succeeding at it at the end. You can take the exam throughout your whole life, right? Not just once, not just twice. You can do it however many times you want to do it, right? So essentially, you are always in this state of preparation along a very narrow ideology, right? You always commit these texts to your memory, right? The, the texts are pro autocratic, pro authority, right? Upward looking rather than um, rather than creative and uh, liberal values. In our data set um, that we use to look at the whether or not the protocol of the exam worked or not. Um, the youngest person who reached the final stage was 13, very young. The oldest person was 59. And you know, if you think about the life expectancy during that period, um, you know, it, it, you're easily 40s, right? So you spent your entire life on the preparation. So in my book, my argument is that not only the bureaucracy get uh, got uh, not only did the bureaucracy get the best of human capital it claimed the time of the male population it claimed the mental energy of the male population so that the male population and, and also the female population because it was usually the mothers who tutored the young boys in the exam preparation. So there was some spillover effect on the female part of the population. So essentially, the entire population devoted, maybe not the entire, but a substantial portion of the population devoted their time, energy to doing one thing, right? So then the issue is, do you have time for other things? Do you have time for technology? Do you have time for, say, liberal values and uh, and do you have the mental energy to come up with political opposition to organize societies? And so, so that's the way that the exam sidelined the society, sidelined the independent forces in terms of commerce, in terms of intellectual class, in terms of uh, political you know, opposition. So essentially, in multiple ways, in terms of values, it was a pro autocratic value. In terms of the time ownership, in terms of mental investments, everybody was devoted to this mechanism of autocratic power consolidation. And I use that way of thinking to explain the actions of emergent democracy, actions of liberal ideologies in China. Let me ask you about. I guess it's the the role of elites in this whole conversation, and, yeah. and because the way in which you're framing the the story is that it's a very large scale endeavor, right? And this way you're homogenizing pretty much the entire society yeah. and the mechanisms that you described. Um, but I'm thinking I had uh, Yu Wang uh, a few months ago yeah. here in the podcast, 
and he has this uh, whole theory about the sort of tension that emperors face yeah. with this elites that yeah. seem to have the opposite interests in, in some context. Um, I think you're going to tell me that already through the um, insertion of this meritocratic system, you're shrinking uh, the elite that could uh, oppose you if you are the ruler. But how does uh, the idea of elites and uh, and the tension between different communities in yeah. sake of power fits into this into your 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 ideas? So, so I think I, I should be careful about using the word uh, elites. Uh, there are two kinds of elites: born elites and the elites who kind of made it, you know, acquired the elites. Uh, I don't know what's the proper term. Um, it, it's not that China didn't have elites. Of course, they had elites. But more and more elites became the ones who succeeded at the exam rather than the ones who were born in the elite family. And think about that conversion, right? So the exam was designed by the emperor, by the imperial system. By succeeding at that exam, you also owe the mobility to the system. If you are born an uh, elite, you owe your status, you know, could be economic status, could be political status and social status to your ancestors to your ancestry, to your bloodline, right? So the the direction of the loyalty is fundamentally different between the born elites and those elites who succeeded at the exam. So the exam system cultivated a group of elites who are fiercely loyal to the system rather than the ones who have independent wealth and independent sources of power who could potentially compete with and even pose a threat to the sovereign ruler, right? So that was, the second one is basically the European path. Right. And the first is the Chinese path. And my co-author, Claire Young, and I are working on a book. Uh, we call it The First Great Divergence, and, and basically the political divergence. And we use that way of thinking to explain why Europe became the way it was and why China became the way it was. And the critical difference is how the elites in these two civilizations became uh, entangled with the imperial system, or they remain a separate, independent entity away from the... The way I think about emergence of democracy is that when the ruler cannot control everything, there are conflicts between the ruler and, and others, they reach a compromise. Right. So, okay, so you pay taxes and then I, I, I let you alone, right? So, Whereas in China, that situation never arose, um, in, in part because of the exam system, maybe the other factor. Right? So if you look at the data, it is very clear that intra-elite conflicts decline substantially over time that the exam system was introduced. So the historians call it symbiotic relationship between the rulers and the officials. That symbiotic relationship became more of a feature of the system after the exam was introduced as compared with the time before the exam. Before there were quite a bit of conflict, uh -huh. um, but then the exam harmonized their relationships. So there's a, another uh, way to think about this, though the mechanism is different, which is that it's known as a selector theory. As a rational ruler, what you want to do is you want to widen the supply uh, pipeline to the system. In that way, everybody who entered into the system knew that he was dispensable. 
the emperor could get rid of him easily. So essentially, there's a building check and balance when you open the system to the wider society, when you grow the pool of the candidates. Whereas a closed system, it's almost like tenure, right? So professor has tenure, uh, so therefore professor says whatever they want. But, you know, if you're on contract, right, you better think Be twice. Careful. Be careful, right? So, so if you have a contractual system, you're open to people who apply and I say, okay, I like you, I give you one year contract. That person thinks about these things very, very differently from one who has lifelong tenure. So that, 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 that's how we explain why the exam system being precisely because it's open, precisely because it's application, application based, gave a lot of power to the autocrat, right? So it's kind of interesting. It's kind of a democratizing the process, yeah. but it is actually making the system less democratic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's a fascinating um, idea, right? Because it makes compatible, yeah, what you describe as the virtues and probably the flaws of, uh, of, the, of the system. And, and I want to ask you about that because I'm, and now that you mentioned that you're working on a first grade divergence. Yeah. Um, the first time that I thought when I saw the book was that it was going to be a book about uh, the Great Divergence because it was yeah. called The Rise and Fall of yeah. China. I thought, and then I thought, well, if it's not about that, it's going to be about the concerns about the long term success of the current Chinese economy model or something that is going to predict that China is going to collapse after the rise of the last um, 30 years. Um, but it is not as you describe it, what you're saying is there's this, uh, mental institution that can describe well, the, that has played this sort of role of, uh, both a blessing and a curse yeah. with it. Uh, however you do, uh, touch on a great divergence sort of episode that yeah. is fairly early. And I want to make sure that I'm using the terms that, uh, you use in the book, you call this period the Han Sui yeah. interregnum, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, tell me about that and and please use this opportunity to talk about what happens with technology, yeah. right? what, what are yeah. the effects yeah. of, okay. uh, of the exam on yeah. technological progress. So uh, I describe that period as China's European moment. Um, that period had, um, you know, some 30 political entities, sometimes in parallel with each other, sometimes uh, rapidly succeeding each other. There was um, quite a bit of autonomy of an intellectual class. Um, they were not necessarily supporting them to the political rulers. And there was quite a bit of independence as well. So some intellectuals, I only have an anecdotal story, right? So some intellectuals openly defied Confucianist uh, virtues. For example, one intellectual, uh, his mother died and then he, you know, he feasted on wine, on meat, uh, to purposely show that he was not, uh, you know, he was not, he was not worshiping his mom, which is really a violation of Confucian norm. And then when a neighbor died, he cried like baby, right? And even though that neighbor was not related to him, um, so there are some really interesting stories about intellectuals purposely defining. Confucianism during that period. And there was quite a bit of mobility of human capital across different political boundaries. So if intellectual is not happy in one kingdom, he will just go to another kingdom to work with another uh, different ruler. And there was also competition and warfare among these kingdoms. So that's basically Europe. Right after the collapse of Roman Empire. And in my book, I also said that China got to that European moment uh, kind of uh, almost before Europe because China 
dissolved from a unitary empire into that period of disunity in 220, right? Europe um, sort of went to the, the era of divisions and competitions after the collapse of Western Roman Empire, which is 476. Okay, so China kind of got there earlier. But the problem, not the problem, but but the but what happened was that China finished <laughs> the European movement uh, by 500, 580. Um, and and now we go back to the to the exam story um, that dynasty that reunited China established the civil service exam system, which basically put China on the permanently unified. So China never went back to that European moment because I I argue, but maybe other historians disagree because of that exam system. Its ability to homogenize ideas, its ability to homogenize, homogenize the human capital, its ability to basically to prevent society from emerging. So now you ask me to relate this to technology. So we spent six years constructing database on Chinese historical inventions on the basis of uh, source materials compiled by really giants in uh, history of science, Joseph Mina and, and also other Chinese uh, researchers. What we can show is that prior to the sixth century, China reached two peaks of technological development defined as inventions per capita. Um, and one was during this European moment um, 220 to 580. And the other was in the uh, sort of 4th century, 5th century BCE. That was also a, uh, a time when China was divided into seven kingdoms. And, and that was a very well-known period. It's called the Warring States period. Um, ideas were free flowing, and uh, so so the phrase "let one hundred flowers bloom" that came from that period. Confucianism was created during that period. Confucius himself would roam around the country, selling his ideas to this kingdom, selling his ideas to another kingdom, right? And there was free debate, um, and so. The insight from that, right? Uh, definitely, it's not a like a revolutionary insight because many people have used that insight to explain Europe. Um, the insight of that is that creativity required freedom, freedom of ideas, freedom of ideologies, cognitive freedom, right? Including the ability and the opportunity not to spend all your time preparing for an exam, right? And and the ability to adopt different ideology. It could be Confucianism, it could be Buddhism, it could be Taoism. We also have data on ideological evolution and the um the data show that ideological diversity began to decline substantially between about 10th century, 11th century, and then by 13th century, it, it had another decline. So in terms of our technological data, China experienced the first decline uh, after 6th century. And then it stayed at a pretty high level until 10th and 11th century. So the first decline was a result of the unification of the country, right? So some 30 kingdoms were reunified into one empire. And then the second decline could be attributed to the ideological homogeneity facilitated by and weaponized by the civil service exam system. So that's how I explain the trajectory of Chinese te technological development. But earlier you did ask me about scale and scope. So let me come. So this is about the collapse of scope conditions. Mm -hmm. 
scale, we have data on how many technologists were employed by the government. And I use that as an indicator of the degree of government support for technology. It, it, it's not intentional support. It turns out that the Chinese government not only employed technologists, they also employed humanists. So the Chinese government had a preference to keep intellectuals in the political system. It doesn't matter whether it's technology or poetry, but they just want to keep them. Mm -hmm. That level was very high, right? And the, at, 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 at its peak, you know, something like 70% of the technologists were employed by the government. If you think about the ancient times when you had to work in the field to feed you, yourself and to feed your family, to be able to draw a salary from the government was hugely liberating, right? So that was crucial to Chinese technological success because the government employment basically created a leisure class, right? These people could think and write without regard to their economic livelihood. Right? So the, essentially the opportunity cost of the inventions were reduced by this arrangement. I don't think any other civilization had this degree of the government support so early and to such an extent. In fact, if you read the economic historian's view on the role of the government in technology, including Joseph Needham, they were uniformly negative on the role of the government. They thought that the government just employed these people and didn't really do much. And they also argued that the government stood in the way of Chinese technological development. Uh, there was a famous sentence by David Landers in his book, Wealth of the Nations, which said something to the effect that Chinese people are smart, you know, very ingenious, but the government stood in their way. So in my book, I disagree with that, right? The government was a enabler of technological inventiveness and technological progress, but it was enabling only when there was sufficient degree of scope condition. When you remove the scope condition, when you only have the scale condition, then technology failed to develop. And then I use that way of looking at things, at history, and apply it to today's time. So let me ask you one final question precisely in that direction, which is about the the influence of those ideas beyond China, and you yeah. started describing how the exam was indeed adopted yeah. in other societies. And the question very specific there is, well, why didn't these societies develop the Haitian type of model? Yeah. Um, and the second part of the question is, what type of shock should we have in order for uh, change in this model, right? The, yeah. the exam is probably not going to go away anytime soon. And that put us into like, what are your uh, perceptions of, of the future of, of China as a society? Yeah. So, so, uh, so other societies did eventually, uh, you know, had their own bureaucratic system, right? Prussia, Britain, and the United States. But the sequence is that in these societies, you already have entrenched political institutions, religion, and society, and commerce. Bureaucracy sort of came along as an additional force. So the democracy kind of competed with, and maybe in some cases complemented with other forces in the society and in politics. Whereas in China, bureaucracy became an overwhelming force and at the expense of everything else. So essentially the bureaucratic development had totally different effects in China. It kind of compressed the space, political space and ideological space. 
Whereas in the West, bureaucracy arguably enlarged that space by by providing uh, meritocracy and intellectual coherence and professional expertise, right? Mm -hmm. So you add that on top of religion and raw politics, and it's diversified the Western society, whereas in China, it's exactly the opposite. Why exactly the Asian European rulers didn't think of using the exam system to achieve the same in effect, political effect, as the Chinese emperor, I have no way of knowing because we don't really know the history that didn't happen. We kind of know the history that happened. Even there, we struggle sometimes. So I really don't know. I mean, I am not a European historian, and maybe uh, European historians would know. But but this, I'm willing to say that that from the from primordial time, it seems that the European system was built on military power, right? Combat, military conquest, right? Look at the Roman system, gladiators, Roman conquest. Um, the power of the military in the European political system seems to be an order of magnitude bigger than the political power and the raw power of the military in the Chinese system. The Chinese system, the military power was always subordinate to the civilian power, and civilian power was based on exam-related capabilities and expertise, right? So, so why different societies made these different choices, I don't really know. My job is to specify the consequences. In terms of how to shock the system out of this equilibrium, I think China was already well on its path to get out of this system by establishing multiple paths of mobility and success. Private sector, globalization, you know, for me coming to the United States, right? And, you know, theoretically speaking, I can also go back to China. These multiple paths were established to dilute the power of the bureaucracy. So even though China didn't introduce constitutional reforms and democratize the political system, and you know many people believed and argued that the system remained monolithic because they didn't introduce constitutional reforms. I have to say, you know, previously I was sympathetic with that view. Now I believe that. There are multiple to plurality, right? You know, private sector development, and even the the fact that Hong Kong was separate from China uh, in terms of operational autonomy, uh, that you have globalization, working with foreign companies, you have academic exchanges. I think these are also legitimate mm -hmm. to plurality. The problem with these with this path is that they don't really have a legislative basis. These are discretionary decisions that politicians made. And in that system, the politicians can make these decisions to allow this path to go forward. But the but these paths themselves do not give them protection against the reverse reversion, right? So that this is where China began to go down a different path under the leadership of Xi Jinping. They chose to reverse these and uh, and. I kind of worry that China is kind of going back to the the Kuzi era when you again emphasize homogeneity at the expense of heterogeneity. Right? You still have scale. Right? The government is very powerful. The government has a lot of money. Although you know, even on that, the economy is slowing down. 
how much the government is able to continue to support science and technology, I actually have some doubts. So even even though we theoretically believe that Chinese government has scale conditions, I do believe that the financial basis for those scale conditions is being weakened rather than being strengthened. Right. So, but but the overall point is that only when you have both, you can succeed. And China is losing rapidly on the scope side. Even though with a scale, I don't think that they can go back to the kind of economic growth path, technological path that they were on before. Well, um, thank you very much. I mean, this conversation took us from uh, the very beginning of Chinese history to the present. I'm, I'm very glad uh, uh, about that. Thanks for your time. Um, it was a great pleasure to chat yeah. with you about the book. Yeah, thank you, Javier. And, and by the way, I'm not a historian, so my interest is always in the present era, but I want to use the history to educate myself about the present era. Well, we have a great job at this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for tuning in today to the Economic and Political History Podcast. Don't forget to stay connected with us on YouTube and Spotify. I'm your host, Javier Mejia from Stanford University. Feel free to follow me on Twitter at Javier Mejia C and connect with me on LinkedIn. You can find me as Javier Mejia Cubillos. Until next time, stay engaged. Thank you and take care.